Suggesta. The temple blends in with the landscape, forming a unity of wild strength and harmony. It was bleak and windy. The flow of clouds and the balance of the mountains seemed to be dominated by the sanctuary. Without it there, the forces of nature would be titanic. The ideal balance of power and order is achieved in the horizontal and vertical divisions. The spirit feels secure and calmed in contemplation. Buildings of this type are power stations of the highest order. In them, musical and heroic life thrives, casting a spell over the centuries. The power of the earth is expressed in them. In this sense, the earth drives them upwards as crystallizations. One feels ancestral connections. On the other hand, they are compositions of the spirit, that is, they are at once formations of unconscious and conscious power. When I climbed up to the theater, I would often look back at the sanctuary, and I found that the marvelous was growing with the distance. Fortunately, the Greeks understood the ranks of diminution and its relationship to greatness. Just as a crystal appears as a diminished yet revealed model of the earth, the state, acting as the patron of all other arts, becomes the practitioner with architecture, and its order is directly reflected in the renowned structures. It could cyclopically reveal its greatness in them, but instead it offers a sublimated pattern. It is this that gives them a combination of power and musicality. The Titanic, then, is an onrushing and overwhelming force of great spaces, the brutal capacities of the earth. One may think of the limitless forests of the new world, a mirror of the void, excessive and ruthless, but somehow beautiful. Carving out a forest path would be impossible. Here man can only measure himself with the excess, not against it. It is a violent and imposing order. Peace may be found at its center, but this could take one's whole life. More than anything, such a task is left to the generations to find settlement, then raise it to an order. And yet, once the temple is formed, the previous age may be lost. This is why harmony is so important. Great architecture has the imposing force of the mountains but the subtlety and beauty of caves and forest hollows. Free movement is essential. One should have a sense of peace entering and leaving. However, the sense is not equal and is not a matter of being one with nature. The temple is an interim territory. It calls to metamorphosis, even forces it. Thus the temple springs up from the depths of the earth as a sanctuary, a unifier. Although its appearance is similar, it is neither desert oasis nor shelter in the mountains. Survival is not what is at stake. It holds a higher purpose, the creation and dominion of man. It is said that the architect of the Munich Cathedral made a deal with the devil that it forever remain a sacrifice to darkness. At its center, his footprint marks one of the tiles. One may ask whether this is a triumph or a delicate balance. I am warlike by nature. Attacking is one of my instincts. Being able to be an enemy, being an enemy, perhaps that presupposes a strong nature. In any case, it belongs to every strong nature. It needs objects of resistance, hence it looks for what resists. The strength of those who attack can be measured by the opposition they require. Every growth is indicated by the search for a mighty opponent, 
or problem. For a warlike philosopher challenges problems to, to single combat. A task is not simply to master what happens to resist, but what requires us to stake all our strength, suppleness, and fighting skill, opponents that are our equals. The warlike man is the titanic man. This is the danger in the myth. It is dualistic, paradoxical. In it, there is greatness, but also the potential for absolute destruction. Nietzsche is a mirror image of Antaeus, the giant who wanders the earth, wrestling every being he comes across. He cannot be defeated so long as his feet remain in contact with the earth. A similar titanic strength can be found in Milo, the heroic wrestler who would test his strength against everything, including boulders and tree trunks, before which he would find a fateful death. At the same time, Milo would demonstrate mastery of his strength by wrestling one-handed, holding the delicate pomegranate behind him for the match, then showing how it was not even bruised afterwards. There is also the cavalryman, who must harden his horse to war, but in doing so he uses a soft touch to turn his prey animal into a predator. An old story tells of a warrior, otherwise stoic, who jumped through a window and beat one of his orderlies near death simply for rough handling of his horse. The Anarch is this figure. He welcomes the titanic strength of nihilism embraces it, and descends into its center. He is capable of wielding its forces, but holds on to them as armaments. He faces war and peace with divine calm, and knows that the highest order requires patience as much as will. Extreme opposition is the greatest sign of power, and to freely choose between them is mastery. It is in the war between the titans and gods that order and destruction, dominion and nihilism find their highest expression. The Anarch prefers peace because the times insist that he must.